Thanks, Mark. Thanks, guys. Oh, you guys can take your seats. And um, it's great to be back here at Emerge Church. And I think I called it, I, th- I think I called it like Resound Church or something like that. First time I came had to, uh, on, uh, on uh, Instagram. So Mark quickly corrected me that I got the name of the church wrong. But what a, pl- what a place of worship this is. It's just, it's just incredible. And I want to say to Jason and, and to the team, just I, I, am, I am absolutely blown apart by how strong and how deep and how rich you know, this is, this is not like the Narang River, I'm living on the Gold Coast, it's like the Nile River. It's that, it's that big, it's that powerful. So thank you so much for, uh, where is he? Thanks so much for what you're doing. And uh, Keith, thanks so much for what you do. <laughs> Keith, I just, I just wanna say, I, there's something very lovable about you. Something quite humble about you too, you know. And uh, you picked up that sound of music thing really quickly, which I noticed, you know, very talented. And, uh, but you know, I, I, uh, I th- I've got two words for you. Uh, the second word is accelerate, but the first word stretch. And the reason why I, sa- I put it in that order was beca- is because this is a year of stretching and taking you beyond your capacity and beyond who you think you are. You know, there, there, is, there, is, a, there is something huge inside of you. But in order to get that out, then God puts you through some process of stretching, but only to accelerate you in the purpose of God. And, and I'll just simply say that no eye has seen, no mind has dreamed of what God has prepared for Keith in the 21st century. In Jesus' mighty name. <laughs> oh, so good. I want you to play all the time. Just come back when you feel like coming back, Keith. Just come back up here, right? When you think we're lulling in the meeting, we need to be geared up. Come on back, all right? Give the band a hand, eh, as they take their seats. I, I've got, it's a bit of a mistake, this, right? Because I got this for, for Jack and for Tiana. And uh, I could have saved some money, couldn't I? <laughs> because it's to celebrate their one year anniversary. And I was gonna ask some questions because they've been going out together like for six years or something like that. I wanted to discover what went on in those six years and uh, how it came about that they've only married for one year. But, but I'll, I'm gonna give this and I'm gonna give this to, I went out, did my own shopping to get this, but this is for Mark and Nina. And, um, and this is to say, this is just to say how priceless Mark and Nina actually are. I don't know how many churches you've been around and how many men and women of God, but I, I don't, there's a TV show called Undercover Boss. And, uh, and there's a new one called Undercover Billionaire. And no one knows who they're actually talking to. And I would say that's like your senior pastors. They are, they are undercover geniuses. They, they hold a legacy and hold depth and hold wisdom like few hold. And also they're not instructors, they're fathers and mothers. And that's a rare thing nowadays, to have people that actually care for us in a rich and deep way. But I wanna take my hat off to you. You know, I, I speak a lot, but I rarely meet a father and mother of, of not just the house, but a father and mother of the country. And I wanna thank Thank you for digging deep and I want to thank you for, for your humility. I want to thank you for building a great church. But even, even the people you see, I've bumped across three couples that, that have mentioned your names first in terms of being influencing uh, upon their lives. And, and that's, just, that's just the tip of an iceberg. So I want to say thank you so much. And just to bless you, I've got a present. And if you could give that other one to Jack, that'd be great. Hey, give them a huge round of applause. Um, my, uh, my son came up, well, I'm, uh, we were in England and my son came over seven years ago uh, to live in Sydney. And uh, since we came over a year ago, we've hardly seen him. We've seen him less living in, on the Gold Coast than we did when we were in England. And, uh, and, but he came up, he loved it. He loved Christmas with us so much that he went back down to Sydney, he came back up again, you know, for a, a second dip. And uh, we had just an absolutely great time with them, you know. But I asked him, I said, how did you find lockdown in Sydney? Uh, how did you find the isolation? How did you find it just, just you know, in a, in a uh, he's like in a bed sit, you know, uh, in Kirribilli. Uh, it's a great area and you can sort of see the Sydney Harbour Bridge. But I said, how did you, what did you think about, um, about lockdown? And he said, I loved it. I said, well, you're not supposed to say that. You're supposed to say that you hated it. You're supposed to say that you felt, you felt like you wanted to, you know, that you're going stir crazy and you wanted to get out and meet all your friends and, and you felt 
totally um, uh, disconnected from the world around about you, but it ticked every box within him. He loves being disconnected from the world around about him. He can't wait to get COVID because then he got seven days, seven days of a guilt-free isolation, you know, and he probably wishes he was in a house with two others and you get 21 days of delicious guilt-free isolation. And uh, he, he likes church online, you know. Um, you know, as part of him prefers church online than church in reality, even though he never watches church online, just turns it on. But like most people who turn it on, they never really watch it, do they? They're just having a chat, having a cup of coffee, uh, looking up Instagram and, and things like that, you know. But, uh, but he, he, he likes it because he's an introvert. And I'm here tonight to unlock the power of the introvert tonight. There's memes on the internet about introverts. There's a picture of a um, contented walrus. And the catchphrase says, when you finally call someone back and they don't answer. It's a great day for an introvert when you're returning a call that you've left for 24 hours and they won't pick up. Uh, you, you can now relax because it takes a lot to actually make a phone call. And don't mention Zoom calls to introverts. You, you've got to recover on the Whit Sundays for three weeks from one Zoom call. Uh, there's a picture of a worried cat looking at a clock and uh, the caption says, I have to be somewhere in six hours, so I think I'll start psyching myself up. And uh, it says that happiness is successfully closing the elevator door before anyone else gets in. Now, listen, I just, if I was talking about extroverts, it'd be a lot louder, right? So I realize that introverts laugh on the inside. <laughs> and I realize that you're doing a fist pump with no expression on your face. So I, I don't mind that because I know exactly where you're coming from. But if it wasn't for introverts, there'd be no Einstein, there'd be no Bill Gates, no J.K. Rowling, no Steven Spielberg, no Abraham Lincoln, no Elon Musk, no Michael Jordan, and no Mark Zuckerberg, which might not be a bad thing for the last name, but for everybody else, there would be none of these geniuses on earth today if it wasn't for the power of the introvert. Yet when it comes to church, let me just talk about church leadership, that when it comes to church leadership, for every one introvert church leader, there's 10 extrovert church leaders. It's totally disproportionate. And God needs to raise up churches where the introvert leaders are magnified and multiplied. And this is one of those places. You do not have to be a loud mouth in order to become a great leader. And it's the same in the world. You don't need to be a raving lunatic extrovert in order to get places in the world. You need to believe in the power of introversion. And I would say just in this room that 50% of you are extroverts and at least 50% of you are introverts made up of melancholics and phlegmatics. There's genius in this room, but he's buried by a lack of celebration and is buried by condemnation. And I, I'm prophesying that what, what I wanna see is a new type of leader arising, a producer, a director, a thinker, a strategizer, more behind the scenes than in front of the scenes, less guru, more God glorifying, creating churches that are less boom and less bust and more consistent and more strong in season and out of season. You build a church on a super charismatic leader, it always booms and busts. I've just come up from the land of boom and bust called the Gold Coast. Every church that's boomed in the last 20 years has gone bust in the last 20 years because they're built on an extrovert guru. There's strength in it and there's tremendous weakness in it. And God wants to build His church on extroverts and introverts, but He wants to make it one for one, not 10 for one. And it's got to start somewhere, and I believe it's going to start tonight. There's four reasons why extroverts have an unfair advantage. Number one, because they're often the ones chosen at school to lead things. They're more self-assured, they're more sociable, they build close relationships with the teacher, and they get practice. 
And so when an extrovert gets saved, they've already had 4,000 hours of leadership experience leading, leading the football team, leading the cricket team, leading the hockey team. So when it comes to church, they're the ones chosen to do the work of leadership in church because they had an unfair advantage from day zero because they were born an extrovert. Uh, number two is they often, they're the ones that make introverts close down and go unnoticed because the loud mouse and the show-offs. So many show-off sanguine people around that it just eventually annoys all of the introverts because we can't get any words in because they're talking so much. And number three, melancholics usually stumble over their own perfectionism. Nothing's quite good enough and they lose perspective. And they're prone to condemnation that leads to a sense of failure. And to cover up a sense of failure, they cover their mouth with a great sense of, um, of criticism and uh, of a great sense of cynicism. They become cynical people to cover up their own innate sense of failure. Their sense of inadequacy eliminates them from leadership until tonight. Phlegmatics usually are so wanting to please cholerics and make them happy, they end up doing jobs but not ever end up doing their personal vision. You want to be a vision person, not a jobs person. Underneath every job that Moses had was a prophecy. That's because when the Spirit of God came off him onto the 70 elders, the first thing they did wasn't to pick up a spade, it was to prophesy. You want to get back to the prophetic river that's inside every one of you and become a vision fulfiller, not just a job doer. And number four, we think that leadership is the domain of the extrovert. It's been drummed into us but it's not true. And I wanna say that I wanna untap 50% of the brilliance of the church. My aim tonight is to release the power of the introvert both back into leadership and every domain of reigning in life. And to stir into your introversion, stir in salvation, stir in the power of the Holy Spirit, release the Holy Spirit, and then release the genius in you. Turn to someone right now and say, I think there might be a genius in you. Go on to the left and to the right and speak it with faith tonight. Your shyness, your nervousness, your reticence to step forward may not be anything more than emotions that you need to manage for the rest of your life. They might simply be like a sore back that is managed for the rest of its life. They might be the smoke or the exhaust of a beautiful V8 engine of the introvert. Some of you are hung up on everything you're not that you stop looking for everything you are. Some of you think, well, I'm just an overthinker. Yeah, you are. Manage it. Somebody's brought along the nirvana in Christian thinking, thinking that one day your emotions will just fly off. Emotions do not fly off. You manage your emotions. As long as you become a river controlled by riverbanks and not a flood, you're in business to become a champion for the kingdom of God. God doesn't want elimination of overthinking. He wants the management of overthinking. So stop being led by what you think are weaknesses and start to realize they're the exhaust fumes that prove that there is a V8 brand spanking new engine underneath the bonnet of your life that's ready to go. Don't let overthinking overshadow your creativity, your thoughtfulness, your sensitivity, your wisdom, and your strategicness. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Can I have an amen? amen. Uh-huh, I'm preaching well, aren't I? <laughs> to the thoughtful. <laughs> It's good they're coming out of their shell. While I say that, people are often saying to introverts that it might be time to come out of your shell. It might be time to raise your voice, time to be counted, time to be decisive, time to be assertive. And each one of those are good qualities, but some animals take their shell with them. Thank you very much. Snails do. 
tortoises do, armadillos do, crabs do, mollusks do. Some of you are like starfish. Starfish do. It's just that they take their shell with them wherever they go. It's a haven of peace, shelter of recovery. It's a bunker of strategy. It's a part of your brilliance. It's not part of the downside of who you are. It's a part of the upside of who you are. You've created a shell. So use that shell. Hibernate in that shell. Use that shell to get ready to throw shells of hand grenades upon the enemy's camp. But don't discard who you are and who God made you to be. Our actual perception of Jesus is often an idea imposed on us by extroverts. We think that Jesus was loud, assertive, charismatic, and good looking, yet the Bible says he wasn't. The scripture's gonna come up. It says in Isaiah 53, it says he grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire. He was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and familiar with sufferings, like one from whom men would hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. You're hung up with the thought that you can't excel in this place and in his plans because you're not good looking enough. I just need to say this because most of us are obsessed about the way we look. Jesus Christ was not a looker. So when you see pictures of Jesus, you think, well, he, he, he did carpentry and, uh, and so he must have had a, a strong physique and yet obviously he had muscle atrophy. His muscles would bulge for approximately five days and then he'd lose those muscles. There was nothing, the Bible says there was nothing in his appearance that was attractive. If anything, he was average looking. If anything, people would just walk past him, but nobody would mention anything about the way he looked because he didn't trade on looks. Sometimes good looks can actually become a curse to you because it's like someone who's a billionaire. You don't know why people are coming close to you. Sometimes looking neutral can actually help you because you know that people who are coming close to you are sincere in their motive. You don't need to be as judgmental of the motives of the people around about you. Sometimes it can actually be a gift to you. He had no natural attraction, nothing in his cheekbones, nothing in his biceps, nothing in his swagger. Now it's weird me preaching this, but I'm preaching well though, aren't I? If I do say so myself. Out of the first 44 presidents of America, starting with George Washington, 29 were over five foot 10 inches tall. In the presidential election since 1900, the winner in every election is on average one inch taller than the loser. And the reason is because taller people are the ones, those who do better at sports, those who are picked out. They're the ones who get leadership experience. They're the ones who become confident and self-assured. The world is like that. But when it comes to the kingdom of God, it's an upside down kingdom. This is what the Bible says in Isaiah 42. Here's my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight, I put my spirit on him and he'll bring justice to the nations. He's not gonna shout out, cry out. He's not gonna raise his voice in the street like a 1980s evangelist or like a TV evangelist or a TV healing evangelist. Right? Every time I shout when I'm preaching, it's because I don't quite know what I'm saying. I'm just trying to mask, mask the fact that I've lost a degree of conviction, you know. It says that a bruised reed, he'll not snuff out. He's got soft touch. He's not, he's not macho. This is a metro man. So if you think Jesus is macho, this is saying he wasn't macho. He didn't have big mufflers. This is, this is Jesus metro. It says in faithfulness, he'll bring forth justice and he'll not falter or be discouraged. So he's consistent till he establishes justice on the earth. In the law, the islands put their hope. 
And it's true that Jesus rose his voice at the tomb of Lazarus and shouted, Lazarus, come out. And I suspect when he overturned the tables of the money changers, he didn't just, uh, he just, uh, didn't just say it lightly. My house will be called the house of prayer. I'm sure that he shouted that. But his overriding nature is one of quiet. His overriding attitude was one of kindness and sensitivity. He had the soft touch. He did a lot of socializing, but also he loved a lot of solitude. This is Jesus. The thing I've noticed coming from England back to Australia is, the, is shop assistants in Australia are very pushy people, aren't they? They want to know everything about my day, how my day is going. I can't wait to tell them that my marriage just broke up. I'm filing for bankruptcy just to shock them in, in, uh, in their uh, so-called care for me. But I'd rather window shop than be pushed into shopping. And it's the same with the kingdom of God. We've come out of being pushed to shop. We've come out of style of church being pushed to shop. We've come out of a style of evangelism being pushed to shop. And yet we've moved in culture-wise to to window shopping. And window shopping doesn't suit sanguines because they want to talk a lot or clerics because they want to push you around a lot. But it really suits phlegmatics and really suits melancholics. And I want to say if there was a season, if there was an age for you, that age is happening right now across planet Earth. If there is a shift that's happening, it's a shift that's moving from extrovert to introvert to bring out the very best in you as culture changes around about us. In, in Matthew eleven nineteen, it says, the Son of Man, this is your Jesus, uh, came eating and drinking. It, 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 this scripture says that John the Baptist came uh, not eating, not drinking. They said he had a demon. Jesus came eating and drinking, and uh, they said that, that he was a glutton and a drunkard because uh, he spent a lot of time with tax collectors and sinners. May I suggest that's how introverts work. We need to have a food revolution. We need 2022 to be a food revolution year because that's how introverts work. It's, it's we need to break the ice. You can't just stare at someone and start talking. You have to order a coffee, a latte. You have to order a, a Coke Zero. You have to order some food because food is incredible. It breaks the ice. It means that you can window shop someone. It means the way they speak isn't ordered. It's not five points from a cleric. It's just meandering as a river meanders. That's how society loves to move. That's how Jesus loved to move. If Jesus didn't walk so much, he would have had a weight problem because he loved his food. Every time they saw the disciples, there was a drumstick in the left hand. hand. They just, they loved to eat. They loved to drink. Why? Because you're dealing with an introvert. And the introvert needs to break the ice. And the best way to break the ice is softly. And the best way to do it softly is to introduce a food revolution. So I might suggest, even though I'm talking right, a huge gamut of stuff right here, that let 2022 be a food revolution. You'll get everything done. You'll get mentoring done. You'll get coaching done. You'll get discipleship done. You'll get evangelism done. You'll get friendship done through a food revolution. Don't ignore food and become too cleric for who you actually are. Allow people to window shop. Allow yourself to be more like a river and less like a road. And you'll find that God will be able to do incredible things uh, through your life. They reckon that the greatest fear in America isn't the fear of death or the fear of failure. It's the fear of public speaking. Yet for a introvert, it's easy to place everything under the banner of fear when it's not fear at all. It's just the way you wire it. If an introvert or an extrovert walks into a room, and let's call the room pixels for the sake of understanding, then an extrovert will take in 10,000 pixels. 
but an introvert will take in 100,000 pixels. An introvert's gonna take in the smell of the room, the light content in the room, the atmosphere of the room. They're gonna read the room. They're gonna find out who's in that room. They're gonna take in 100,000 pixels. And so it just simply makes sense that it's always gonna be an overawed experience for an introvert to ever speak publicly because there's too much information coming their way through public speaking. That's not a fear, that's a fact. And the only remedy for that is to take time out to process. And you need to become a good processor. And when it comes to God, God wants to work through the process with you. Sometimes when I'm filled with anxiety, Jen just says, my wife says, just get over it. But the fact is the introverts can't just get over it. You can't just leave it on the shelf. You can't just leave it on the bench and get on with life. You've got to gather it, gather it, gather it, gather it, and then process it. But God will work through the process with you because He loves you, because He made you that way. God becomes the coach to the introvert to take you through things one line at a time. And if you're there dissecting conversations that you had last week with someone down to the finest detail, the Holy Spirit is there in the finest detail talking with you and reinterpreting that conversation. But the Holy Spirit will never say, just forget about it. He'll work with you in the deepness of how you actually think because God knows you take in more pixels than most people and you'll come out with strategy and you'll come out with revelation and you come out with truth like nobody would believe what could come out from the depth of your soul. What we need is a game changer. People to rise up in quiet strength, acts of kindness without bells and whistles, acts of generosity without the jingle jangle. Acts of faith, humility, mercy, affirmation without the fireworks. Uh, we need to raise up introverts with the food revolution that, that, uh, that can dream dreams, fill in gaps, run the race, be who others aren't, step out in faith and to lead the way. So here's three things that you need to do as, I, as now I, I start to land this message is number one, you don't need to be loud. This is what it says about uh, Elijah's experience when he was on the mountain. I'll just take it from, because uh, he, when he was on the mountain, there was a, an earthquake, God wasn't in it. There was a, a huge wind, God wasn't in it. There was a fire, God wasn't in it. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went to stood at the mouth of the cave because God was in the gentle whisper. I remember doing some pre preaching masterclass uh, back in the United Kingdom and this guy did seven minutes and he, he, he talked about a conversation that he had with God and he said, then I said this to God and God said that, then I said this and God said that and I said this and then God said that. And when he finished, I just, when he was talking, I thought I've never had a conversation with God like that ever in my life, you know. I've heard Danny Guglielmucci, you know, say that he has, but I'll, I'll leave him as an exception. But uh, apart from him, I've never had, a conversation with God. And so I said to him, I said, did you really have that conversation? And he must have been felt intimidated by him by me because he said, no, not really, right? And then I realized that God never speaks, God rarely speaks verbally. What God is, is he attaches truth with prompting. And God speaks and not through a huge booming voice, but God speaks through the change in cabin pressure. As the wind begins to lift you up, God speaks through the flicker of a neon light attached to something you just read in the Word of God. He attaches the, the, the sound or the feeling of a submarine hitting the sand on the, on the, in the ocean of the earth while you meditate and see something that takes your attention. That's how God speaks to us. But you think that God's a raving extrovert and God only speaks through a huge booming voice which you've never heard in your entire life. And it's absolutely not true. Extroverts have applied that, spoken that, preached that, but it's simply not true. God's in the still, small whisper. The whisper of a flicker. The whisper of a blink moment. That's where you find God speaking to you. Number two, uh, you don't need to be self-confident. 
I mean, somebody's lying to you. You need to be God confident. But the greatest enemy that you could ever have is self-confidence. Self-esteem is an enemy to the esteem that you get from being a child of God. Self-love is an enemy to the love that you receive from God's love through Jesus Christ dying for you. Stop substituting superior quality for inferior quality. The problem with self-confidence is that you eventually give up and give way and it moves into a state of complete no confidence like Moses had till eventually he got God confident. And this is what it says in 1 Corinthians about you in verse number one, verse 29. Uh, let's start in verse 27. The God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so nobody may boast before him. And in chapter two, verse three, it says, I came to you, this is Paul, I came to you in weakness and fear. It's part of his personality package and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but your faith might rest on God's power. Are you listening? He chose the weak things of the world to confound the wise. When God chose Moses, he chose someone with a public speaking phobia. He chose someone with a stutter. He chose somebody possibly with Tourette's. So don't feel like God can't choose you. God loves choosing people that have an obvious weakness as well as subtle weaknesses. When God chose Gideon, he chose somebody with a deep inferiority complex and God thought, hang it, I'm gonna choose him anyway. When God chose Barak, he chose uh, somebody who needed a woman to hold his hand into battle. But God saw through the weakness and God saw that he could be strong in the midst of his lack of confidence. We think that we ought to be strong in ourselves, yet the Bible proves there are no strong people. I'm just gonna stop there and say that one comment again because I think it's classic. In the entirety of the Bible, every person side by side, male and female, not one of them was strong. They were weak people filled with the strength of God. But Satan's come along to you, introvert, thinking you need to be strong in order to rise up in God. You don't need to be strong. You need to be conscious of weakness and that God would shroud that with his strength and invest you with the power of heaven. That's strength so that your confidence might not come from self, but it might come from God. Now, that'd be a great time for a huge clap offering because I just think that's our peak now. So if y'all waiting for me to peak, I just peaked, all right? I just peaked, all right? So, so pretty soon Keith's gonna come up. He's gonna think that's a cue for me to come up. Dave's peaked already. I, I was, okay, see, he's, he, he's there right now. You know, the problem we've got is Samson. Samson killed a 1,000 Philistines in one encounter. And he tore a line apart with his bare hands. But when, we, when you think, what, what on earth does he look like? You think that Samson, if you go on Google, Samson looks like Mr. Universe, massive abs, arms like a gorilla, long hair like a Hillsong worship leader. <laughs> but why? Why would, why, would you, why would you think that? If Samson's strength came from God, why would you even go there? If you're gonna paint Samson, why don't you paint him as a, as a pasty-faced computer geek? Why, why draw him wrong? That's what you're up against, introverts. You're up against a satanic system, a systemic system that wants to keep you down and wants to keep you invisible and wants to keep you in your place and wants to keep you in a place of anxiety and overthinking when those things are just characteristics of somebody who's a creative, somebody who's a strategist, someone who's a producer, someone who's a director. Just to my third point. This is a great point. It's my last point, right? My last point is you don't need to be great. You just need to be good. 
That's the problem with this generation. You want to be awesome. Not to forget about being awesome. Just be, just be good. You know, one of, my, one of my most popular messages when I preach around is, is how to have a, a slightly better marriage. I mean, you don't, if you've been married, you don't need, a, you don't need an excellent marriage. You just need one that kind of works. You, you don't need a Mercedes, just a Skoda, just a, you just need a Daewoo. But you know, the problem with reading a book, especially written by Americans with Ken and Barbie's picture on the front, Right? is that they're lying to you. They're saying we've got an exceptional marriage. No, you haven't, buddy. You're hiding the bits and pieces that are awkward and the stuff that doesn't work. Because none of us are called to awesomeness. We're called to goodness. And some of you who are introverts need to think, I don't wanna be awesome. I'm not here to show off. I'm here to be good. If you can rise into goodness, then you're rising in to a good thing. I love it when we moved from England to, from Australia to England, that there's a guy called Steve Penny who prophesied over us and, and uh, to us it's a really big thing and he, he just said one small step, he, he copied the moon landing, one small step uh, for man, one giant leap for the kingdom of God. In other words, steps belong to man, but success belongs to God. You've never done a miracle in your life and never will. It's God through you that does the miracle. So stop trying to be a miracle worker. Stop trying to feel the power of the Holy Spirit. I rarely feel the power of the Holy Spirit because it's for the Holy Spirit to feel the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm just a pipeline of the Holy Spirit. So stop trying to feel ghost goose pimples. Stop trying to, to feel might and just start to rise up and realize that it's your job to step out in faith. It's God's job to do the miracles of faith. You don't need to live a great life, just a good life. It says in Psalm 37, verse three and four, trust in the Lord and do amazingly. It says, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land, enjoy safe pastures, delight yourself in the Lord and He'll give you the desires of your heart. I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read a short story to you. It'll take about a minute, but how about the rest of the band? Come on up now and just get yourselves ready. This is a story. This is a story about a stone cutter. And it's a great little story, right? When you think that the story is going on for a little too long, and it's not, but when you think it is, the story is gonna pull up really quickly after that. But this is my conclusion. And I'm gonna conclude in the form of a creative story. Because you're looking at an introvert that loves to dress up and disguise himself as an extrovert. But that's just because I lack a bit of confidence to play myself purely as an introvert. Sometimes you need to wrap yourself up in a bit of sanguine for socialization, but when you get home, quickly take it off and revive and celebrate the person that God's made you to be. Once upon a time, everyone just slide, slide down in your seat just slightly because it's like bedtime story right now. Once upon a time, there was a stone cutter and every day he traveled to work and back again. He was very happy. One evening on his home, he passed by the richest man's house in the village and looked in the window. Peering through the window, he could see beautiful chandeliers and soft couches. And he said, oh, I wish I was the richest man in the village, sighed the stone cutter. And an angel came down and said, so be the richest. And he was. And he, he lived in the finest and ate the most expensive food and slept on a sweet mattress. He was very happy. Then one day a prince passed by in a golden carriage with a canopy over his head, drawn by four beautiful white horses. He said, oh, I wish I was a prince. Beside the stone cutter, an angel said, well, so be the prince. And he was, and he rode in his carriage, lived the finest of lives. He was very happy. Then one day he looked up and he felt the sun's rays beating down on his head. And he said, that sun's more powerful than me. I wish it was the sun. And an angel came down and said, so be the sun. And he was, and he beamed down from the world and was very happy and was very powerful. And then one day he looked down and saw a cloud blocking his rays from the earth and said, that cloud's more powerful than me. I wish there was a cloud. The angel said, so be the cloud. And he was, and he blocked the sun's rays, made the earth dark. And he was very powerful, very strong and very, very happy. And then one day a strong wind came and blew the cloud away. And that, that wind, he cried, is more powerful than me. 
I wish I was the wind and an angel said, so be the wind. And he was and he blew across the earth and everything was shaken by his power except for a cliff. It stood strong and resolute in the, for, in the face of the wind. And he said, that cliff is more powerful than I. He said, I wish that I was the cliff. And the angel came and said, so be the cliff. And he was. He felt very, very strong and very, very powerful. He was very happy. Then one day, as the cliff, he felt a tickling at his feet. A stone cutter was slowly but surely chipping him away. There's a genius in you. Stop wishing you were somebody else. There's beauty in you. Stop being jealous of the beauty of someone else. Some of you are like the Welsh valleys, full of wisdom and full of greenness. But some of you are like the Everglades in Florida, full of life, buzzing with life. Some of you are like the Swiss Alps, just filled with rocky outcrops and adventure and drama. But some of you are like the Australian outback, just brown. But there's approximately a thousand shades of brown. There's probably more pictures taken of the Australian outback than any other outback on the face of planet Earth because everything's beautiful in its own way. And I'm gonna prophesy that over you so that tonight you can put that book of comparison back into the bonfire of hell and you could celebrate the fact that you're fearfully and wonderfully made. I want the Holy Spirit to help me do this to strip you of fear and to strip you of self-doubt and to strip you of menace from the enemy so that you can rise to be the greatest you that the world has ever seen. Everybody stand up together.